We're exploring in Dungeons and Dragons some monster tactics. We're looking at key monsters in the monster manual and asking ourselves as a DM, you're allowed to be ruthless. You're allowed to try and take a monster and play it the best that you can to, to really challenge the party. If they want that experience. They want that gold. They want that magic sword. You've got to earn it. You've got to go up against some challenges. And we're coming across our first legendary D&D iconic monster, the Eye Tyrant, the Beholder. And the Beholder, along with dragons, um, a lich, golems, vampire lords, I mean, this is iconic Forgotten Realms, Mysteria, um, D&D. And I do believe as a DM, what I try to do, uh, there's certain monsters you encounter all the time. And then there's certain monsters as you go through your D&D career, I mean, like orcs and things like that. But as you go through your D&D career, I pick adventures or I write adventures where you're going to fight these iconic monsters because that's, that's kind of this moment that you talk about in your D&D career where it's like, I fought a dragon. I beat a dragon. I, 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 I did this. I completed this. That's, that's very, very exciting. So I want to give that with the beholder. But at the same time, can't be baby cakes. I can't make that easy. You've got to earn it. So what we have is, is actually a very, very fearsome, fearsome monster. We're at challenge level 13. And we've got a lot of hit points, 180. We've got an armor class of 18. I, I guess that's okay. But the first thing in looking at that stat block... Um, when I try to evaluate monsters, I look at the challenge rating because that's what a lot of DMs use to throw against the party. The party is equal to this CR level. So this way it's kind of a fair fight. Maybe I adjust it a little higher if my players are veterans or, or I lower it a little bit if you're new to D&D. But even if you're new to D&D, by the time you behold the beholder, you've leveled up enough. You have enough experience. So I tend not to bring the challenge rating down with the beholder. But we look at hit points and armor class because they're going to be high at these higher challenge ratings. But remember, the party is going to be significantly more powerful. And they're going to have interlocking abilities. Unless they're a party of all fighters or a party of all wizards and sorcerers, you're going to have the ability to fight. You're going to have the ability for stealth. You're going to have the divine. You're going to have the arcane. They're, they're powerful. They're well-balanced. So those hit points, that armor class, the raw damage attacks, they tend to be not as impressive as you think existing outside of the monster manual. But the Beholder is different. Magic is the way you get around higher level parties. Blasting them with magic. That's why magic just becomes so deadly at the higher levels. Especially if you have the ability to cripple the wizard slash mage slash magic user slash arcane in the party. Most parties will only have one. Um, what we do see with duality in a party, you might have a frontline fighter, uh, paladin, or berserker, barbarian, and you might have a second line, a second tier fighter like a monk, right? Not as good, different mobility. You all often sometimes maybe see like you'll have a, uh, a frontline rogue and then a second tier like a bard. But very rarely do we see multiple magic users, multiple wizards in that capacity. So if I have a powerful magic type monster creature with the beholder, if I can take out the wizard in the party, then they're at my mercy for the magic. Leading into it. Now, this isn't, I mean, in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, it was pretty crazy going back to AD&D. And if you ever have the chance to kind of look through some of the earlier books and, and see the DNA, that prototype, that genesis for Dungeons and Dragons, there are tons and tons and tons of charts to roll random monsters. AD&D was obsessed with random monsters, and they didn't care about level. Challenge rating didn't exist in AD&D. It was, it was very, very deadly. You really had to be on top of your stuff. So you could be wandering around a city at night, right? You're just wandering around a city maybe because you're investigating something or you're going to one end to another. And the DM would roll on this random chart. And it could be like, you know, a thug shows up or a wild dog shows up. Or literally it was like a vampire lord shows up, you know, which would be like, you know, CR 17 in D&D in 5 here. So I, I say that because 
um, in the beholder isn't just something that shows up. It's not just kind of wandering around. I mean, I guess it could be, but it doesn't quite just wander around. The beholder is something central to the campaign. The beholder is massively intelligent. So we're going to see it um, setting up a scenario, working through shadow organizations. I mean, pull in the Thieves Guild from Forgotten Realms. A beholder's running the Thieves Guild. That's what we want to utilize leading in, where the players learn of this shadowy figure, but they don't quite know it's a beholder, and it's leading them down a path for a final encounter. That's the first setup. So this way, when they realize it's an eye tyrant, and they realize, wow, um, we're in trouble. What I often would like, would like to do is um, I have the beholder polymorphed, or depending on the setting, I'll have an illusion spell up. So they think they're meeting some whatever evil wizard, master, something, machinations of, of whatever guild. And they kind of posture and, and go back and forth because they can sense something's powerful. No one ever has true sight up. Very few players are, are, are walking around with that. And not that I'm lying to my players, but as a DM, what I present may or may not be true. It's the perception of what you see before you make any skill checks, spell checks, knowledge checks. And, and from that capacity, you can tell, okay, this is obviously something serious, you know, powerful, boom, boom. But you're not thinking it's a beholder. Then we drop the shields, we drop the illusion, bam, there it is, eye stalks and all. So think about how, think about how you can ambush the players with this monster. The ambush is key because now we get into... Um, a whole bunch of eye rays where we can paralyze, we can fear, we can charm, we've got telekinetic, we've got sleep, we've got disintegrate. I mean, we have them breaking off to where we can control the, the party, and yet at the same time, we can damage the party. So you have two possible ways of influencing. The beholder itself, um, I have found it tactically to work differently than most monsters in that I want to be in an open space. I want to float around in an open space. I and I have the anti magic ray, of course, with my um with my main eye. Out in the open, yes, um, everyone can shoot at me. Everyone can cast spells at me. Everyone can fight me, but I have full three hundred and sixty vision of all my eye stalks, which means in that moment, especially since I get to make multiple attacks, that's the power of the beholder. So how can we how can we utilize stuff? How can we take stuff and bring it to the point of the adventure where when they fight the beholder, first we want that prestige of the reveal. When they fight the beholder, we're out in the open, so I may be vulnerable to all your stuff. You're vulnerable to my stuff. And my magic makes you roll lots of saving throws. And if Saving throws even at that level, and saving throws might be boosted, especially if you're p playing character classes, um, dwarves, dragonkin, dragonborn, draconians, uh, stuff like that, where you have natural um, boosts to your saving throws. It's D&D. &D. It's D&D. &D. I mean, you've rolled a D20 where you have such a crazy modifier to hit. You know, if you roll a three or higher, you hit and you roll a one. There is a one on every single die in D&D. &D. So if I can force enough saving throws on you, besides outright damage, that that's powerful. There's a chance that you're going to fail. So many of us as a DM, we tend to go for the raw damage, you know, no disintegrations, just blasting out massive disintegrations, massive amounts of damage, and that has its place. But with the Beholder, make it iconic. Make it iconic. Take advantage of those influence rays, those influence things. Things to consider. Very, very potent. Very, very powerful. Ultimately, breaking Tactica here a little bit. I feel like as a DM, I got to give you this, this last piece. I mean, we're looking at these monster manual Tacticas as how to use them the most brutal way. The Beholder being iconic and having the ability for fear, charm, and paralysis, and enervation, you know, reduce the strength. This is going to be an iconic fight. So I sometimes, I'm going to do my best to kill the party, but at the same time, I will make a less than optimal move if there's a chance that I can charm the fighter and now have him just start taking off all his gear and doing something crazy 
or if I can weaken the wizard to the point where the wizard's on the floor and can't even cast the spell, those memorable moments, I mean, tactically, it's better just like, look, just disintegrate that elf over there. But tactically, a player, if you can make funny things happen, if you can make interesting things happen, you know, through the arrogance of the beholder, it's just so sure of itself that it does these funny, crazy things, that's worth more than a party kill because it's creating for this boss fight, so to speak, a very, 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 very memorable moment. So I'm breaking rank here a little bit because we're looking at just ways to kill the party, but the Beholder has many ways to make it memorable and fun, and I'm willing to push that button. I'm willing to go in that direction, but I'm still going to try and outright kill you.